Okay, I think we're going to uh, uh, begin begin proceedings. I'm I'm uh, Robin Burgess um, from the LSE, I'm also director of the International Growth Center at, at the LSE, and I just wanted to say a couple of uh, words of introduction. The first is obviously that um, uh, this report is very different from many of the types of reports that we've seen discussing growth in the UK. I mean, the issue of growth is not just you know hugely a big pressing issue in the UK, it's a big pressing issue all over the world. And uh, by way of introduction, I wanted to sort of mark out three things that are very different about this report uh, from the kind of normal discussions we have about how to spur economic growth in the UK or elsewhere. I mean, the first is obviously that the set of commissioners is very diverse. So what we have is a, a group that includes John Brown, uh, you know, the chairman, former chairman of BP, Richard Lambert, Rachel Lomax, people like Nick Stern who have spanned both academia and policy making. So part of what's interesting about the report is what happens when you have a group that's sort of from business and policy making meeting and talking with a group that has uh, from academia. So from the academic side, we have people like uh, Chris Pissarides, uh, Philip Aguillon, um, and Francesca, uh, Francesca Caselli. So this sort of diverse set of people thinking about growth is, is something that's quite, quite distinctive. The second thing is obviously that the, the perspective is very much long run rather than short run. So it, it's not about the sort of debate about stimulus versus austerity. It's this sort of you know, a view taken over, a sort of a 50 year view, which then allows the authors to think in a much more strategic sense about the what, are the, what, are the, what, what strategy should be uh, adopted in order to get growth going in the UK? What institutional changes are needed to support that, uh, that set of strategic uh, changes? So that's sort of the second way in which it's very different. And the third way is that um, it is really taking very seriously the idea that we can't assume that Britain has a competitive edge over other countries. That Britain is sort of embedded in a global economy and uh, in order to get or maintain some competitive edge, you're going to have to invest in a whole bunch of sectors that will give uh, Britain some edge in terms of competing in the world of ideas, goods, and services. So I think that those three things make the report very, very different from what we've seen in uh, uh, existing debates on, on economic growth. So as chair, basically, my main role is, uh, is timekeeping. So what, what I'm going to do is... Uh, to just set out how we're going to organize the session. So what we're going to do is we're going to have the two co-chairs of the uh, report, um, John Van Rienen and Tim Besley, in that order, present the report, taking about 20 minutes each. And then we're very pleased to, to have uh, two journalists, first David Smith from the Sunday Times, and secondly Richard Davies from The Economist, to act as discussants, which you know, it was not on the program, but we've managed to, to organize in the, in the last few days. So they'll take about 10 minutes each discussing what uh, Tim and John say. And at the end, we'll have about 20 minutes where we will have a mic circulate. And we, you know, we'd very much encourage um, people to ask questions because part of what we'll be talking about is not just what the report says, but how you're going to take this sort of idea, idea forward. So in the last 20 to 30 minutes, we'll, we'll, we'll have a mic circulating and you'll be free to... to um, to ask questions. So, can I invite John Van Rienen to, to begin the presentation? Thanks. <clears throat> okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming, and uh, thanks to Robin and the discussants uh, for, uh, for helping make this session possible, and Imran for organizing the, the, the RES. Um, so, uh, t t I guess uh, Robin has already kind of told you a bit about uh, what's going on. Those of you who are particularly interested in uh, the document, we do have a few left over, so <laughs> we can give away a, a few if you're interested in reading them. It's mercifully short, is one of its uh, great things. Um, I have to say thanks very much to the funders, uh, the ESRC and, uh, and, and, and uh, LSE Knowledge Exchange Hyfe, for helping fund this. Um, as Robin said, you know, we have been doing, we started doing the uh, Growth Commission in January 2012, and we had a, a kind of, we, had, we set ourselves a mandate to finish it in one year, which we uh, successfully fulfilled. 
Um, and as he also said, I mean, that one of the advantages, I think, of the Commission over many of the other reports, so you might say, well, why another report of growth? Here's a, a few of them, and some, you know, so many of them are very good. Well, I have another one. Well, you know, we did want to stress the kind of longer run issues. So you know, the, the debate in this country and in many other countries has been very much dominated by the short-term debate over austerity and fiscal stimulus, which is important, but it's kind of crowded out, in our view, many of what we think are maybe the more important debates over what we need to do in the longer run to set policies and institutions to get long-run growth in this, in this country. And that was really the, the kind of whole raison d'etre of, uh, of the commission. So we focus very much on evidence. If you're interested in all the more detailed uh, analysis that we've done behind this, it's on the website. The final report, though, we wanted to make it short, short enough that uh, a minister or an academic or a policymaker could read on a one-hour plane journey to make it easy, easy to digest. Um, and we also, one of the differences about it was that we have a diverse background of academics and policy makers. And finally, we wanted to make it different by focusing not just on the analysis and the uh, prognosis, but also on how to actually make changes. What, what you know, you know so there's a Chicago kind of critique, if you're so clever, why aren't you rich? Uh, the challenge we set ourselves was, if these are such good policy ideas, why haven't they already been done? So the political economy issues um, are, is something which is tried to, you know, wove it in, into the report. What kind of things could we do which were built to last rather than things which are just going to be thrown on the, uh, the scrap heap? Okay, so what's the story? The story is uh, a simple one, and it's a kind of, I think, an optimistic story, and there's a lot of doom and gloom around, um, you know, rationally, since, you know, the size of our economy is about 3.5% smaller than it was in 2008. But if you look over the longer run, we're going to argue that... Um, Britain's many advantages, many assets, um, stable rule of law, flexible, relatively flexible labour markets, tougher competition in product markets, a strong university sector, as I hope we've seen in the last few days, openness to, um, to investments, both in terms of physical capital and in terms of human capital too, through in a relatively uh, open migration policy. And the combination of these things, we argue, actually led to a reversal of the econom relative economic decline that we have had um, since, say, the end of the 19th century. The last three decades after the end of the 1970s have been relatively successful ones, as I'll show you. However, having said that, there are also important deficits. One of the, the, the important problems we think we face is a lot of policy instability, which has ha created particular problems for long-run investments. Uh, and a second problem is that the growth and the improvements that we had since the late 70s uh, came at some expense. So there was an expense of the growth was not inclusive, there was a big increase of inequality, as many people, Steve Machen, have, have emphasized. So um, we're going to focus that the, the problem relates a lot to long-run investments, investments in people, especially human capital into the bottom third of the population, investments in terms of infrastructure, uh, especially around transport and energy, and um, problems around uh, innovation and private investment as a whole. And the outcome of this is kind of lower productivity still than our main uh, counterparts. And you know the, the whole pro the whole um, report is about how to kind of deal with those those problems. So we sometimes call this a manifesto for growth. So I'm going to go through this very quickly in summary. The kind of three areas of human capital we think that. Um, Improving human capital requires uh, dealing with the uh, school system, uh, creating a system which is more flexible, which is freer entry and exit of schools. Um, we, in combination with this, we also need to reduce the problem of disadvantage for the bottom third of the population, which is a cause of this you know, high, high inequality that we face. Around infrastructure, we propose a whole new way, a whole new architecture for making major national infrastructure decisions around um, strategy board, a commission, and an infrastructure bank. Tim will, Tim will describe that. To try and deal with the endemic problems we've had of underinvestment and opposition to major, major projects. And finally, we have a, a, a number of uh, suggestions and policy recommendations of how we should deal with problems of uh, general innovation and investment. To, one is to do with increasing competition in the banking sector, the other with, with the business bank, and the third over various tax reforms. 
Okay, so this is the setup of the, uh, the, the report and the, 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 what we're going to do. I t I'll, f I'll start with the economic story of the UK, then get on to these third area, three areas, and then finally make some conclusions. So what about the story of the UK? What is the story? So here is uh, sometimes like we call, I call this the reversal of misfortune. So what this graph does is it shows you the relative GDP per capita, I mean, that's not the only measure of well-being, but it's an important one, of the UK at 100 relative to other countries. So if we go back to, say, 1870, uh, on the left hand of, of the graph, you can see that you know, in, the, in the late 19th century, the, you know, the UK was kind of the leader. It had about 25% uh, higher GDP per capita than the US and about 35%, well, over 40% higher than Germany and France. And then over time, other countries caught up with the UK as expected. Um, but by the late 1970s, we'd actually fallen behind, although we'd had absolute increases of our material well-being. In ter relative terms, we'd fallen significantly behind the US. The US had about 40% higher GDP per capita. France and Germany, something like 10 or 15% higher. So that was a long process over 100 years of relative decline, which actually changed over the course of the next 30 years. So um, you know, by on the eve of the crisis in 2007, Britain had actually overtaken con our continental European counterparts and had narrowed that gap with the United States. Um, you know, here's another way of seeing the same graph. This, what this does is it looks at the relative growth of GDP per capita. So that starting in 1980, uh, this shows that the UK, and this even includes the, you know, the Great Recession, the period we're now in up to 2012, the UK cumulatively had a better performance of uh, GDP growth per capita than the US, Germany, or, or France. And you know, compared to the period since the Second World War, uh, you can see that like, the UK had slower growth than those other countries. So there was an improvement. There was a significant improvement in the UK's performance, even taking into account the problems we've had over the last few years. Now, the first thing people say when you, know, you show them this, so, you know, most people got surprised by this going in the doom and gloom, is that it was all finance. It was all a kind of bubble to do with the financial sector. Now, it's true that the financial sector contributed towards this growth, but we shouldn't, over, we shouldn't exaggerate that. So if, you, if we actually look at productivity growth, which, of course, is the key one, you know, the, if you think about what, 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 what GDP per capita is composed of, you can decompose that into uh, the jobs market, if you like, kind of workers, the proportion of, the, of potential workers who are employed, and that's certainly improved. But the other part, which is the you know, important part for long-run growth, is productivity growth, kind of output per work or output per hour. So if you look at the growth of that, focus on the, the you know, take out the things we don't measure very well, such as health, education, and public sector, we had something like a kind of 2.7 percentage point growth per annum on average after 1979. If you break that down, so this is, I guess, broadly the kind of, you know, um, pre, this is the kind of conservative period, this is the labor period, it's actually very similar. It's about 2.8 percentage points a year in both periods. And, you know, yes, financial services are important, but of that 2.8 percentage point growth, say, after 1997, financial services only accounted for 0.4 percentage points of that if you do a standard type of decomposition. So most of the productivity growth we experienced was growth in other sectors, things like business services, wholesale and distribution, the more boring, unbubbly sectors of the economy. We suggest that things were more than, far more than financial services. And you can cut this data in many other ways, but I think this is a pretty clear demonstration of the fact that it wasn't uh, just about finance. So what was it about? Well, what worked, in our, in our view, is a set of things. So one is on policy changes. So there was the introduction of a series of different policies Toughening competition in product markets through prioritization and independent regulators. Toughening competition policy through the Competition Commission and the OFT. There was uh, increasing flexibility of labor markets through reforming the way that the employment, ser employment service, public employment service was delivered, both under the, under the conservatives through things like uh, restart and under labor through the New Deal. Um, changes to benefits, changes to union law, making the labor market more flexible. And this has actually been something which has helped, uh, helped the employment rate. Thirdly, um, in the university sector, a huge increase in the proportion of people who hold degrees, from 5% in 1980 to over 30% in 2011, and openness to foreign direct investments and, and to immigration. So all those were you know, explicit policy changes, I think, which helped 
help but, you know, lay behind some of that uh, improvement we had over the last 30 years. A second thing which worked well, in our view, is the growth of independent bodies. A um, series of different um, institutional innovations. So I mentioned the competition authorities being strengthened and being, you know, being, you know, for example, ministers being removed from decisions over mergers. Nationals of Clinical Excellence making uh, recommendations over healthcare decisions, independence of the Bank of England, and, and so on. Monetary Policy Committee. All these institutions gave more political resilience to um, tough decisions, but decisions which were more informed by, by evidence and also more resistant to the, the, the cha changes of government, changes of, of minister, and also cha changes in the, uh, in the pages of newspapers. So I think um, those independent bodies also have, have been a, one of the success stories which helped un underpin this economic recovery. What didn't work um, so well um, was policy failures over long-run investment. So you can think of this as short-termism in economics, clearly the financial system as part of, part of that problem. Short-termism in politics, many policies, there's ex constant tinkering, rebranding, we see this in apprenticeships, for example, reversals of policies, procrastination, we see this in transport policy over southeast aviation capacity, and not, you know, examples over energy and decisions over, over how to deal with en energy policies like nuclear power stations. Um, the role of independent advice is still limited, and in terms of you know, many infrastructure projects, you know, nimbyism around uh, you know, new, new, new roads, new rails, new networks, well, that's, that's been a constant problem of, of development. Um, the outcome of this is high uncertainty and low investment and long-run assets. The other problem, as I mentioned, is inequality. This just is one example, differences between uh, wages that are 90th and 10th percentile of the distribution, both for men and women, big increases in inequality. So one of the aims of our set of proposals is to think about policies which can both help growth, but can make that growth inclusive by not increasing inequality further and, and preferably by reducing inequality. Okay, so um, I, I'm going to talk about human capital and then leave over to Tim to talk about the rest of the policy, um, policy implications. So let me talk about human capital first. I mean, if, I think, if I think about all the things which are important to growth, normally the one that economists typically would go for is human capital. So why do skills matter so much? Well, from the evidence that we saw um, if you look at reasons for long-run growth, the you know, human capital is probably the most important one of those. Um, we focus very much on, on schooling, ages between 4 and 18, although we also look at other things, but the focus very much is on trying to deal with the flow of people coming through the schooling system. One of the strongest pieces of evidence is that the quality of, of schooling matters, not just the quantity. And of all the different inputs into improving education, class size, resources, Teaching is the most important input, and that, that really comes clearly out of, out of the research. So improving the quality of teaching is the number one most important thing. And as I said, if we can do something about this, if we can somehow raise the quality of teaching and therefore human capital, it gives us a double dividend. It gives us an advantage of increasing growth, but it also helps reduce inequality. So you know, I think if we think about human capital, it has the potential prize of dealing with both the uh, problem of low growth and also the problem of, of uh, high inequality that we have in the UK. What are the UK problems? Our test score results in the international schools like PISA are mediocre. We have a long tail. I mean, we do very well at the elite ends, like the places we are now, or, you know, Oxford or Cambridge. We do much more poorly at the other part of the distribution, uh, in both in terms of schooling and in terms of individuals. Um, and there's a very strong link between disadvantage uh, and low academic achievement. Uh, in Britain. I mean, that's true. In every country, of course, if you're born to richer parents, you do well, but that relationship is particularly strong in the UK. So what can we do to kind of tackle that? So we have a series of proposals. One is to increase the flexibility of the system. So we, um, you know, we are, we're supporters of the movement towards greater autonomy for schools, um, greater flexibility for good schools to grow and for poor, poorer schools to shrink. We think the best way to do that is through uh, networks of schools, the sponsored academy, sponsored academy type of system, whereby schools which are successful uh, are able to grow, not just physically, but also by taking over struggling schools which are weaker. So spreading networks of better practice and management, better practice 
uh, in teaching over a large numbers over large numbers of schools. So creating a much more flexible ecology or ecosystem of schools. And that has to be embedded in uh, a system of accountability, and you know, so it's not totally just free choice and decentralisation. One of the key ways of getting proper accountability in that system is to also tackle disadvantage. So one of the problems that we currently have is that the current system through Ofsted, through uh, information and league tables, focuses very much around averages. And it doesn't focus enough on the progression of the weaker, uh, underperforming kids, especially from low-income families. So our proposal is actually to have much better information on the progress of disadvantaged kids through the school systems, so you know, improvements of value added for, say, pupil premium kids, um, and have the target system, have the offset inspection system, have the information system very much focused around that. We also think that in terms of uh, expanding academies, these, these more autonomous, directly funded schools, the focus should be, as it was originally under the City Academy program, focused on uh, disadvantaged areas to really try and tackle this problem. So work by uh, Steve Machen and, and James Renoir has shown how successful the early city academies were, which were focused in disadvantaged areas, at improving the performance of, of kids. We think you know, that sponsored academy idea, where you get expertise from outside of the school, say from businesses or from universities or from networks of public or private schools, can help in that, that system of improving disadvantage. Finally, on teaching quality, which is you know, a critical thing. We believe that there needs to be a kind of an expansion of Teach First to get high quality graduates into the teaching profession. But we're against the idea that you should make the entry very narrow, so insist on people having first or high two ones to get into the profession. We think that it just as it's, you know, the, the problem is it's very difficult to predict ex ante who's going to be a good teacher. Ex post, when the teachers are in front of the kids in the school classroom, it's actually much easier to figure out which teachers are successful and not successful. So our view is that we should allow greater entry into the teaching profession, but have much more rigorous selection at the end of an extended probation period to deal with teachers who are underperforming, both through training and through removing from the, from the profession. So a wider entry, but also more exit, just as we think that should be true good of schools, that should be too good of the teaching profession. And finally, there's lots of mechanisms of sharing best practice, such as London Challenge, which, which are being, which are being under, underexploited at the moment. So that's kind of our, our kind of skills proposals. I mean, there's other things in the report. I encourage you to read it. But we you know this is our proposal of how we think we could deepen and uh, radicalize the current movement to the academy system. OK, I'm going to hand over now to Tim to talk about the other, other parts of the proposals. Thank you uh, very much, John. Uh, let me just make two quick comments before I launch into our recommendations on this. One is that I think in many ways our report reflects a shift in the economics profession and the way we think about growth. because. Certainly, I used to think, and I think the way we used to teach growth, put a lot more weight on not knowing what the right thing to do is rather than figuring out the best way to deliver what we know is the right thing to do. And many of the problems in the UK, I think, come from knowing the problem and the problem being a very long standing, but not having the institutional structures in place to deliver and to solve those, those problems. So I, I, I'm reminded of the story that when Alistair Darling opened the M6 toll road north of Birmingham, um, he, he, during his uh, opening speech, I believe he said something like, well, Harold Wilson, who was our prime minister in the mid-1960s, would have been proud of this. Because it turned out the plan had initially been made in the 1960s, and this was a speech made approximately in the late 1990s. And I think that typifies, in, in many ways, the issues we have with infrastructure in the UK and why they're problems of delivery. People had identified that particular traffic bottleneck many, many years previously, and it had taken almost 30 years, or more than 30 years, to actually get round to solving it. So what do we, uh, what do we focus on in terms of infrastructure? One is uh, transportation. Um, and uh, particularly roads, aviation, and rail, and the other is energy, where we feel that these are cases where we are aware of the issues. Um, there's very little new uh, analysis of uh, what the policies uh, ought to be. I mean, there's some changing in the agenda, particularly on climate change and how we respond to that in the energy arena. But by and large, the problem has been government-induced policy risk uh, is the main uh, uh, theme that we develop particularly a lack of a clear strategy, uh, which is sustainable, uh, therefore generating a great deal of uncertainty, and second of all, vacillation and politicization of policies and projects. Um, so at any point, there's, there's a proposal to improve the transportation network in a, 
an important way, uh, the politics immediately gets going, delaying and uh, giving rise to procrastination. And perhaps nowhere is that better illustrated than in the context of airport capacity in the southeast, um, where we lurch from one report to another, uh, typically headed by a celebrity um, of some kind. I mean, celebrity in our world, not in perhaps the <laughs> wider world. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, and uh, that leads very often to just more delay and more procrastination. And within that, there's a sort of rigid planning framework um, where the planning system in the UK uh, has little economic content in, its, in the way it develops rationale. Indeed, that, that's, and, and there's limited scope to share benefits. So if these are projects which on a reasonable criterion generate wider benefits for the economy, perhaps one way to make them happen is to think of ways of sharing those benefits. And in international terms, we do a rather poor job at thinking of ways to share the benefits of, uh, of infrastructure projects. So we think the diagnosis is relatively clear. So what are we going to propose um, uh, as our, uh, as our uh, way, of, way forward? And what we propose in this rather grandiose term is a new institutional architecture for uh, infrastructure. Um, because we feel, again, it's a fundamentally a failure of institutions. And that that uh, uh, architecture has three uh, components. First of all, the need for an infrastructure strategy board, which uses independent and expert advice, but is accountable to parliament for obvious reasons, to identify long-term strategies uh, for particularly the energy and transportation sectors. Uh, and we believe that would generate, we hope it would generate, cross-party consensus on the core components of infrastructure investment, thereby at least minimizing the political risk involved. The second component is what we call an infrastructure planning commission. The role of that uh, is, is to focus on delivery of the strategy. So once you have a strategy, you have a set of long-term goals and you know what you wish to pursue, the question is how you turn that into policy. And the role of the Infrastructure Planning Commission is to turn that into policy. And part of its tools should be to share the benefits of development. So if you want to develop in a particular area uh, a certain kind of infrastructure, part of the cost of that will be to agree compensation packages uh, for those who lose out from that. And that should therefore figure into the costs and into the plan. Uh, and there shouldn't be any form of ministerial veto over the Infrastructure Planning Commission's decisions. Uh, I'll come back later to an accusation that often gets made at this point, but isn't this anti-democratic? And at some level, I think that's an important debate to have, but we don't feel, we feel this is perfectly consistent. Just, just as we don't allow ministerial vetoes over the decisions of judges, um, it, it's perfectly uh, uh, plausible within a uh, democratic society to have certain decisions made, provided the individuals who make those decisions are appropriately accountable. And finally, an infrastructure bank, um, which we think partly is a, obviously, as it, as it says on the tin, to engage in the, the finding the finance for infrastructure projects, particularly given our rather distorted system of public accounting, we think that needs tidying up. But more generally, the role by giving, by combining public and private finance, and putting the skin in the game, if you like, of an infrastructure bank, we think it will help to reduce policy risk. And, uh, and we think also um, it, will, it will be a way of bringing in more effectively private finance through this, through this route. So here is an is a, is a illustration of our, the broad structure that we propose. Um, and uh, and uh, we believe this would, uh, would, uh, would uh, provide a, a better basis for dealing with the problems that we started at, at the beginning. And notice the parliament and government is absolutely at the center of this. We're not suggesting you can, in a sense, bypass the political process. It's just putting the political process in the context of an institutional uh, structure that we think will, will work uh, more effectively. So that, that's, our, that's our broad suggestion on, on, the, on infrastructure. Now let me return to innovation and investment. Um, the UK, in spite of the, the, the successes that we have enjoyed over the last uh, 30 years, the UK does still uh, have a low investment uh, share as a share of GDP with heavy weight towards property and buildings. Uh, so this is, this is a, uh, an illustration of that, showing the, 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 the black line at the bottom is the UK's investment performance. And it's been consistently underperforming the other economies that we were comparing, or John was comparing the UK to 
earlier and has been for the last 20 years. So this is, again, a well-known story. There's nothing new about what we're saying about this. The question is why and what we think institutional and other types of policy changes are needed to address this failure. Um, equally, the, the UK is weak in intangible investment with low R&D and patent intensity. And as John uh, t can take a bow here, of course, has recently alerted us to the uh, fact that the UK also has poor management quality uh, compared to many of its competitors. Um, there are many long, uh, well-known long-standing problems, particularly surrounding financing. The Macmillan Report of the 1930s uh, talked about the financing gap for small and medium-sized enterprises. So this is not news again. So I want to emphasize there are many of these issues which are long-standing and need addressing. Um, and we think it's aggravated by a problem of lack of skilled labor. So it, in a way, it's complementary with what we discussed under the school agenda and infrastructure investment. So, so we view this as joined up to the general set of problems that we discussed. So what are the problems? We, we identify four key problems. Short-termism in capital markets. So many of you will have seen John Kay's recent review and discussion of those issues. Lack of competition in retail banking, which goes back before the current crisis. Of course, since the crisis where we've allowed two of our major banks essentially to, uh, well, one to be absorbed by another and, 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 uh, 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 and essentially a preservation almost through government support of the banking structure, we, we've in a sense cemented even more strongly a lack of competition in retail banking. Um, we think there's lack of economies of scale in SME financing and excessive reliance on debt. So we have a few proposals. I'll run through them quite quickly. Um, we think that uh, there needs to be moves towards increasing competition in retail and SME banking. Um, there's been a, this, again, this has been an issue that's been out there for the longest period. I, I always thought the way that this was justified before the crisis was we, we, we have a relatively concentrated banking system, but at least it's safe. Uh, and part of the benefits are that even though we don't have a system, which in the US, the whole system of FDIC facilitates bank entry and exit. Um, in, in a way that we, you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, be able to do without some kind of uh, protection of depositors. Now, of course, we do have a, a stronger system of de depositor support in the UK, but we, I think given the current arrangements, particularly the support that's been given to two of our larger banks, um, we've, we've rather locked in the non-competitive uh, nature of our banking sector for the foreseeable future. And it's very, uh, new, new banks are... Uh, are, are emerging, but at a very slow pace. So one question is whether this should be referred to the Competition and Markets Authority. We believe it should. Uh, and there should be a series of moves that make it easier for people to switch. Um, we, we support, and this is current government policy from the, uh, uh, the Department for Business, Innovation and Skills, to, uh, the, the, the need for an investment uh, for a business bank to support SME investment. But we are concerned about the dangers, the political dangers inherent in having politicians too close to making decisions about who receives support. So in our proposals, we, we point out the importance of having an independent board um, and, uh, and having a clear mandate, um, much as many development banks do. So, so a few years ago, I was asked to review the mandate of the EBRD, and they have very clear criteria for when the EBRD can lend to the uh, private sector in Eastern Europe to do with additionality and demonstrating what they call transition impact, which is that social returns as, uh, exceed private returns. So it's very important to deal with the governance issues. Uh, and, then, and then, as has been proposed, there should, there's the scope for securitization. We, we, to deal with some of the other problems, we, we, again, we go into this in the report, and you can read it at your leisure, uh, talk about voting linked to the length of holding uh, shares, the implementation of vicars, um, uh, the introduction of an ACE. I'm seeing Richard Brundle in front of me. As Richard knows, we, uh, re we, we, uh, we recommended this uh, in the Murley's review. Um, and uh, as far as I know, it's not yet uh, got uh, to the front of the UK policy agenda, but uh, these things take time. But we think the time has come to have a tax system that uh, redresses uh, the fact that there's, uh, you can deduct interest payments for debt, but there's no allowance for corporate equity. Uh, and then we talk about industrial strategy. Uh, I'll leave that hanging a bit because I may come up in Q&A. But we're quite relaxed provided um, there is clarity in what the rules of the game are about 
more activism of the kind, I think, that is in effect taking place. Uh, if you look at, for example, what's gone, in the, gone on in the resurgence of the car industry in the UK, um, it's not the case of... Subs we, our old industrial strategy towards the car industry was essentially pumping money into failing car firms, but we have a new industrial strategy in effect, which, in, which is involved in some key decisions, uh, ministerial involvement, making sure they support that industry without going back to an old-fashioned subsidization strategy. Okay, just a few conclusions then. In, in many ways, uh, the, there is a sort of political economy story that runs through the report. Um, it's, it's an issue of both identifying problems, and no problem that's a problem is not worth repeating. But it's no good just repeating it if you don't know uh, how you're going to go about solving it. And we think the fundamental failures in the UK are about the institutional structures that are in place for schooling, for infrastructure, and to some extent for finance. Um, and uh, we think that they are created by um, the short-term policy horizons of politicians, the kind of adversarial politics which almost obliges one new set of politicians to rebrand or rename the initiatives, even if they were successful of the previous, brand, uh, previous generation of politicians. And we think that the kind of certainty that could be created through our institutions, particularly on infrastructure, is important. And, uh, and that... Uh, and that what we're proposing could, could make a real dent into these, into these problems. Um, we think it's not about not being, it's not an anti-democratic report in any way, shape, or form. It's about recognizing that you need accountability, you need politics, but you need it to be put in the right place for any given decision. And nothing could be more clearly illustrative of that, of course, of the revolution that took place in central banking across the world in the 80s and 90s, where it was realized that taking politicians directly out of the determination of interest rates had all sorts of advantages. And we think it's no different in the areas that we're proposing now, and that provided the strategic framework is set politically, provided that the executive bodies are held to account, there's no problem with extending that model more widely. Indeed, we think it's essential that it is extended more widely. And this needs to be supported by more capability at the center of government, and it needs sustained cross-party support uh, to be politically feasible. So there we go. Those are the main stories. Um, now over to our discussants. I don't know who's going first. Um, I'm going to tell you uh, where we got it wrong, or perhaps not. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, discussing this uh, report. It was uh, a report I, uh, I wrote about when it was published, and uh, I'd uh, recommend uh, people to, uh, to read it. It's a very, it's a very uh, good report, and for, for, from a journalist's perspective, it has the, um, uh, the considerable advantage that it's, uh, it is, uh, it is uh, relatively brief, uh, so, uh, so that, that, uh, uh, that strengthens its appeal. Um, the media uh, tends to have two settings for uh, when talking about the economy. Either it's um, over-optimism and uh, Britain is, uh, is beating the rest of the world, and that's uh, probably the permanent setting for the uh, Daily Express, or it's uh, excessive gloom and uh, we're, uh, we're, we're hopeless and we're, uh, we're getting worse. And I'm always um, uh, uh, um, astonished um, and full of admiration at the ingenuity of some of my colleagues in their ability to extract uh, bad news from the good, you know. So, uh, so it, uh, even when you get relatively optimistic news, there is always a, a headline there somewhere which is, uh, which is pessimistic. Um, the report uh, specifically refers to this. It talk, talks about um, uh, the peculiar British version of uh, schadenfreude that we have here, which is... Um, you know, schadenfreude, as I understand it, is joy at the misfortune of others. Uh, we have joy at the misfortune of ourselves in the way we, uh, we think about the, uh, about the economy. So, um, there were, so I was very encouraged that, um, you know, by uh, three of the things that, um, that uh, John mentioned. I mean, one was this um, uh, reversal of long-term decline that happened... Uh, uh, from about 1980, um, it showed that you know even uh, sinking super tankers can be turned round, even when economies appear to be uh, condemned to long-term relative decline, uh, they can be turned round. Now you can debate why it happened. Maybe it was the wake-up call from the IMF crisis in 1976, and of course the Labour government then began some changes which were taken on by the, uh, by the Conservative government. Uh, but something happened and something changed, and uh, uh, an economy that appeared to be in uh, very long-term relative decline 
uh, did turn around, did turn around quite, uh, quite impressively. Uh, secondly, uh, was the point again that John made that, uh, you know, I think there is a story around about, uh, you know, the, the only thing that was growing before the crisis was financial services, and now financial services isn't growing, uh, that's why we're in trouble. That, that is not uh, the case, as he pointed out. Financial services made a, a much smaller contribution to productivity growth uh, than either uh, wider business services or, or, for that matter, manufacturing. Uh, and that's, I think that's an important story to get over. The third thing is uh, that we, we still have comparative advantage. We still have, uh, we still have a competitive advantage in many service sectors, in high-value manufacturing, in education, particularly uh, further education. Uh, there are many things that we do well. Of course, we could do them better, and of course, other countries uh, are starting to do them as well uh, and may get better. So we have to, we can't, you know, there's no cause for complacency on those things, but we, we should recognize that there are uh, strengths in the, uh, in the economy. So those are the three positive things. The two messages I would take from it, and I suppose the two challenges, um, the first one relates to uh, political continuity. Now, I think one of the reasons for the, uh, the success of that th three-decade period was that we did have quite a lot of political continuity. So we had 18 years with one party in power. I mean, maybe they didn't stick to the same policy all the way through, but the Conservatives were in power from, uh, from 1979 to 1997. And then Labour was in power for a long period after that, 13 years to 2010. And there was, uh, you know, quite a high degree of continuity between uh, the two governments. I mean, it may not have seemed it at the time, but if you think about things like uh, Bank of England independence was a, a natural next step from the reforms introduced by the Conservative government after the UK dropped out of the ERM in, uh, in 1992. So we'd already had an enhanced role for the Bank of England. We had what I would, what I call quasi Bank of England independence and giving the bank full independence, establishing the MPC, was a relatively small step uh, from that point and a very important step. But that was continuity. There was continuity in the main on uh, labor market reforms. You know, not all the labor market reforms uh, that happened in the 1980s, and not many of them were reversed by the labor government when it, uh, when it came in in 1997. Continuity on tax, we didn't go back to having high personal tax rates and those kind of things. So continuity was important. Should we be encouraged or discouraged by the uh, political scene at the moment? I think somewhat discouraged because we've, you know, we, we, the coalition government uh, elected in 2010, I think was fairly determined to uh, reverse quite a, few, uh, quite a lot of the things that had happened uh, under its predecessor. You think of uh, financial regulation, good or bad, but a big change. You think of uh, health reform. Uh, I mean, there, there seemed to be a determination to, as politicians always have, to stamp their own particular model on quite a lot of, uh, the, uh, quite a lot of parts of the public sector. And is that continuity? Were, were, the, were those reforms a good thing? If you, if you think about labor now, you know, there, there may be a, um, uh, you know, a, apart from the rhetoric, some of the things the coalition have done may be reversed for good or bad by, the, uh, uh, by a labor government when, it, uh, when, when we get, next get a labor government. So I don't think we're in a period of particular political continuity at the moment, which is, which is a little bit worrying. The other thing I think is about the, uh, the importance of institutional reform and putting the institutions in place. I, I think we've, we've had a mentality in, uh, in the UK for quite a long time that, uh, you know, you, growth just happens, you know, you should, uh, and, and you should best leave it alone. You know, you shouldn't get too much involved. I suppose that emanates from, you know, our short and rather uh, unhappy experience with economic planning in the 1960s, the Department of Economic Affairs and so on. Uh, the abolition of the uh, National Economic Development Council was, was celebrated as a sign that, you know, the free market was being allowed to get on with it. And in some uh, important respects, um, infrastructure being the most obvious one, you can't just expect it to happen. You have to plan, you have to have, uh, as, uh, as Tim says, you have to have a bit of power, a bit of ability to push things through, maybe quite a lot of ability to push things through, which we haven't had. I mean, we've had situations uh, where 
government departments have been on the opposite side of planning inquiries. You know, one government department speaking in favor of a development of an in infrastructure or housing development, another government department opposing it. Now, that doesn't make uh, a great deal of sense. That is not a growth-friendly uh, 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 government uh, uh, approach. Um, and I think it is also true that, you know, we, again, industrial strategy got a dirty name perhaps in the, uh, in the 1960s, but we are seeing the, uh, the, you know, the benefits of, of industrial strategy. You know, Tim mentioned uh, the car industry, the Automotive Industry Council appears to be uh, becoming established as a model for other sectors. The government is, is now quite keen to do that. So I think we have to think about the kind of institutional change that means that, uh, that, that encourages growth uh, that isn't just a question of leaving it to the market, of, of just expecting that, uh, that growth will happen. And as I say, the report has some excellent suggestions uh, on how uh, we should do this. Thank you very much. slides that um, I, sh I should add that um, I also covered the report when it uh, came out for The Economist and um, gave it the kind of glowing uh, summary that it deserves and also I have a sort of personal uh, in spirit full disclosure have a personal interest in this work in that um, I'm doing some sort of ongoing work with ex co-authors in the policy world at the Bank of England on how short termism can affect investment um, and so I thought, rather than, than, than give another kind of a congratulation over the report, I should, I should, in the spirit of this being a kind of academic conference where we have peer review, uh, offer some challenges. So I've got three challenges for the authors, uh, for John. Uh, and so the first one is that I, I totally understand and... Um, uh, kind of support the idea of, of, of splitting up the uh, structural policy and cyclical policy. There's a lot of heat around what's going on in terms of fiscal policy, short-term fiscal policy and short-term monetary policy at the moment. And what you wanted to do, you don't want this to be just another report, you want this to turn into action. And the strategy seems to have been to kind of take it away from all the, 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 the debate about austerity uh, and because of that, you'll be able to get buy-in from politicians. And I just wonder, is that, uh, is that split between, between short-term uh, response to the crisis and longer-term structural policy, is that just a little bit too clean? I think there's a good case that, that this time really is different. This is the worst recession. This is the, the, the worst period of growth that the, the UK has had since the 19th century. And I think that this chart here shows that um, the, this division between short-term and, and structural, uh, between cyclical and structural policy has broken down. So this is UK planned fiscal tightening. Uh, and it shows that the, what we would normally think of economists as a crisis response policy, i.e. the fiscal policy lever, has, has basically turned kind of structural in the sense that we've got, we're going to have a long-run um, fiscal consolidation. In, in, uh, in monetary policy too, we have, uh, we have some short-term uh, short things going on. We also have two state-owned banks, and that strikes me as a kind of uh, on the verge of stru structural policy rather than, rather than short-term policy. So my challenge is, and, and this comes from my time not as a journalist but, but working in public policy, is what can we do now? What, what's, the, what's the first priority in this report, uh, and it's kind of motivated by this, this second slide, um, which is joblessness amongst uh, young Britons uh, aged 16 to 24, where there are, there are sort of clearly two trends going on. There's a, there's a sort of long term, again, this is a sort of structural trend of people who are inactive, people not looking for work, not in education. And then there's, this, there's, then there's a cyclical trend again. But I think that, that and this is the uh, people that are unemployed, and you can see the clear 90s recession and, and the recent recession. But we know that, 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 it, that it's not that clean, and we know that some of these people who are currently unemployed, because of hysteresis effects, are going to end up in that bottom category that's, that's not going to be looking for work. 
So, so my first challenge is, what first? What, these, are, these are great kind of perfect reforms. Is there anything we can take from them and to apply that to the situation which the UK is, is, is currently in? So, so what first? The second challenge is, is kind of what's your, what's your top priority? So you have talked a lot about the fact that you wanted to, to, uh, to do a short report that policymakers could, could read on, on planes and so on. And I have to say I've worked for one of the policymakers that that's, uh, uh, was part of your report, Rachel Lomax of the Bank of England. And um, people that have worked in, work in public policy will know that if a senior policymaker gets a report like that, the first thing they'll ask is, give me a one-page summary. Okay? So we, as um, journalists, we, we do this. And uh, as, as academics, at the end of our papers, um, we tend to write this, this kind of list of things that we think should be done. And I think we sometimes err uh, in our expectation of the amount of time that policymakers have got to, uh, to spend on, on new ideas. So at the bank, a big chunk of the time is taken up on actually just churning out the MPC decision. At the, at the Treasury, a massive chunk of the time is just taken up on getting the budget done. So my, my, my second challenge is I realise you've done masses of work to whittle this down. You've really focused it. You've got some subsidiary proposals and you've got some main proposals. But what's, your, what's the absolute top proposal? Because I think that with the, the list of people that you've got on the front of that report, if you picked one thing, just one thing to champion, you could probably get it done. But the, the, the full list of new infrastructure board, competition in banking, it's still, it's still very broad. So second challenge is what's, what's top, what's absolutely top. And the, the, the third um, challenge is how, how are you going to take this expert report and turn it into a policy proposal? Um, so we've had a few, uh, a few mentions of sort of Bank of England independence. I'm not sure, I can't remember when Kidland and Prescott and the Walsh papers were, but I think they're in the, in the, in the late 70s, right? So uh, coming up with a good idea and letting it diffuse can take 20 years for it to actually, for action to be taken. And uh, the, it's, the, the report is, is set up as a kind of academic report. A, a policy proposal needs to have things like, to, uh, once, once we've picked one or two of these things, is how, how, are, how are they going to be financed? What are the different options, say, for a business investment bank? Um, what are the risks and benefits and, and challenging, challenger policies? And the reason I mention that is because, personally, having worked in antitrust and central banking, both independent uh, uh, parts of policy making, I believe that's the way to go. But what you're up against uh, with, with the report and with these ideas is, is a quite serious challenge, um, which you're going to get from some parts of the media and some parts of the the policymaking community, that we have set up the, the MPC, um, and I, I believe it, it, it's the right thing to do, but you, you, you have to deal with the challenge that we've, uh, we've had a massive financial crisis. And similarly, similarly in, in competition policy, we removed the national interest test to take politics out of competition policy, but people are now worried that other countries don't apply their, their competition policy in the same way. As, uh, uh, as the UK does, and, and sort of querying that, that independence model. So, you, so you, you, you're really kind of up against it on that front. So the, 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 in summary, three challenges are, what's, what's the first thing we should do? What's the, what's the top thing we should do? And practically, how are you going to get it done? Who are you working with to, to work it into a, a finalised proposal? Thanks. challenges were posed, uh, that we have John and Tim sort of take a few minutes responding to those, and then we'll, we'll get the mic circulating in, around the auditorium. Okay, well, thanks very much, both of you, for, uh, for, for discussing this. I'm, I'm going to pick up a couple of things that both of you raised. So on, I guess, Richard's uh, third challenge, you know, what's, um, you know, 
how are we going to do this? How are we going to take it forward? I, I think the, we're, at a, we're at a very interesting point at, right now because if you look back at the, the kind of story that I gave, you know, we did, we did, make, we did make changes. So as, as David pointed out, you know, we had a, a huge crisis in the 1970s. In response to that crisis, you know, a series of policy changes were, were made which um, were around the labor market, around the product market, around a set of uh, policies and institutions which actually improved relatively the, the British economy. So we're capable of doing this. Part of it is you require a crisis, but we're certainly capable of doing this. And you know, many of the, the, some of the problems which other European countries are, are facing, we, we, have, we have made much more progress in tackling it. Currently, we're, we're also going through a huge crisis. But that's an opportunity that injects some more radical thinking about how we can deal with some of the challenges that we haven't tackled, particularly around these kind of long-term long investment type of issues. And I, I think that the, the timing is also good. There's a kind of cycle to infrastructure investment, for example. And we've kind of lived off past investments we made in the 60s and, and 70s for uh, 20, 30 years. And you can do that for a long period of time. But at some point, the lights threaten to go out. And that is the position we are currently facing in energy policy over the next, over the next five years. So this is a, a moment, one of those unusual moments, where there is an opportunity to actually make change. And that, that actually creates a, a possibility for doing things. We hope that with their support, I mean, we've, you know, we are uh, doing a series of different things, talking to members of all parties, talking to lots of international bodies, getting involved in the nitty gritty of trying to change things. But we hope the report also starts changing the way that people think to actually change some of the, um, the resistance, I think, we've had culturally to try and create consensuses to deal with some of these long-term type of uh, ideas. And, you know, there have been improvements. So even since the report was written, they, you know, there's some movements in the education department to take on some of the proposals we're making over disadvantaged uh, of children. There's been moves around banking competition. There's been moves um, around talking and setting up uh, ways of doing things on infrastructure, both from the Labour Party and the Armament Review and under the, under the government. So I think things are moving. We're not naive. You know, things are going to take a long time to change. But on all these levels, I think it opens up a possibility for things, things changing. On the challenge of what I think is the top priority, I mean, it, it, it's hard because you know, different people in the Commission take different views. Personally, I would put the infrastructure proposals as the number one thing that I think we should try and do something about. I think there's a number of reasons for doing that. On, on, in some times on one level, it's relatively cheap things to do. These are structural changes which don't actually cost all the money. You have to spend political capital to do this rather than just finance. And this, you know, so I think that, although it's a challenging thing to do, is not going to be a, a huge cost. Most of the infrastructure bank is going to be private sector-led rather than, than, than public sector-led, as, as Tim said. I do think, though, that, um, and this is Richard's first point, how the long run joins up with the short run. I think around infrastructure as well, this is, this, this is one way in which the two are linked. So I, I do share his concerns that as the recession is so prolonged, this is going to lead into hysteresis type of effects, which has a very long run effect on dampening our, our, our levels of output. I mean, Larry Summers actually challenged us for this in the very first, um, very first public session we had on evidence on this. So my, my view is something that we could do in addition to the structural reforms that we're proposing over institutions, is actually to uh, commit to make uh, an increase of expenditure on infrastructure, the Chancellor announced uh, a three billion increase over five years from um, 2015. My view, <clears throat> and I think this is uh, supported by actually the IFS Green Budget, would be to increase to at least 10 billion spending on infrastructure starting immediately over the next two years, uh, even you know, as, as, a, as, as a minimum, which I think would help with the problem of growth. It would uh, actually not um, contradict the Chancellor's uh, mandate, which is in terms of uh, current expenditure rather than um, investment expenditure. And you know, given the size we know of fiscal multipliers much larger than expected, I think would have a, would have a, um, a significant effect on, on short-run growth, which would help us in the short run, as well as dealing with this, the, the long-run problem as well. So I'd say you know, in terms of priorities, that's where I would uh, kind of put priorities. And I think you know, there is a... The time is kind of right on a number of dimensions to kind of push that particular thing, which is not to take away from all the other proposals, 
Uh, but I think that's the one, if you're challenging me to do, I would, I would focus on right now. It, I, I'm keen to get questions, but let me just have one small thing, which is, if you ask me about the short term, then I would say focus on housing, which is not really, I mean, it, some of our proposals relate to housing. Um, I, of course, I'm blowing my own trumpet. Tim Leunig and I, I believe, had a very good proposal uh, for expanding housing investment. It's the construction sector. If you look at the, what's been the drag on the economy, I think, in fact, David, in a recent column, pointed this out. Um, and and you, you look at the, big, the biggest hole has been in construction. So if we're talking about short-term measures, then I would be putting a lot of focus on what we can do about stimulating construction. And that's why I think John's right to, to, to say that that's linked to infrastructure. But it's not only about infrastructure, it's about finding ways of getting private investment in housing going at a time when we, we ought to be pumping up the demand for housing. We should be pumping, making sure we increase the supply of housing and actually get house prices down to an affordable level in the long term, not just make it easier for people to buy the given housing stock that we have. But that's a little bit off message from the main report, but I, I, I couldn't resist throwing that in. So um, what we're going to do now is we're going to have the mic move around, and I suggest we collect a few questions before we have the, uh, the panel answer them. So that this, so we could, can you raise your hand, and then also when you ask the question before you do that, just say who you are and where you're from. So there's a, one up the back, right at the back. You, you, know, you know Paul Marcus there in front. Right? That's <laughs> John Beath. Okay, um, John Beath, St. Andrews University. Uh, I'm sorry to have preempted Marcus, who had his hand up in the front row. But I, uh, I have a reason for what, wanting to be first, and that is uh, I'd like to actually go back to what John Van Rien started with, which was dealing with the human capital issue um, and education in particular. Now, um, if I understood your argument right, you were suggesting that one of the problems, or maybe a key problem, in the school system is we don't have enough competition, as it were, between providers. And you suggested that maybe one of the problems is that good managers of schools can't take over schools that are badly managed. And I actually wondered if the problem, if that actually uh, would work, because um, you know, in industrial takeovers, uh, you often find that uh, you might get a good manager or a good, a good board that takes over a bad company, but then they can't turn it around. And the, answer, the reason being that it may not be the management that's the problem, it may be the stock of resources that's the problem. Uh, so how you would tackle, the, how you would actually turn around bad schools is you may have to do something about replacing the stock resources the teachers. There's where you run into an, an a real institutional problem because some of the most resistant unions, I think, to uh, change would be a teaching union. And you'll need to think about what happens uh, in what's been happening in Chicago uh, and in other parts of the US, how resistant, and, and indeed, in, I think, even in Mexico and in Brazil, where they, uh, again, you have these strong, uh, what I call craft unions. Uh, so would, comp would actually, I mean, what, how would you change and improve the school system? Yeah, we're going to do the come down right to the front now. Marcus gets his. Marcus Miller, University of Warwick. Um, I'd like to pick up the point made by uh, Richard on the artificial separation between short term and long term in a context where we've got fiscal consolidation plans that run really, uh, certainly in the medium term, if not the long term. Um, we're often, obviously, we, we now don't have growth. We were told by the LSC Commission that the peak of output in 2010 was not a bubble, it was real, and we're below it even now. So uh, for all the, the words of the, of the LSE Growth Commission, we have no growth. And surely uh, it, it's, it's, it's really very important to focus on why not. The, the short answer in Europe, it seems to me, is this outright fiscal consolidation, which has been embarked upon. Now the problem with the plans 
is they seem to neglect the endogeneity of income and also the hysteresis effects, that both points that Larry Summers has made very strongly. So really, I would encourage the uh, commission to at least um, say something about these issues. Uh, Chaling Coupons once said, you may not like macroeconomics, but it's really important because if you don't get it right on the macroeconomy, you won't get the resources to do all the things that you want to do. Now, there is a warning here, namely that the government, this current coalition government, did set up the Office of Budget Responsibility, which in many ways seems to fit the bill of what you're recommending, an independent outfit full of experts. But I think they've done a rather bad job. So one of the tasks might be to say, what's wrong with the OBR? But I do feel that it's incumbent upon the Growth Commission to address the issue raised by the discussant. Why don't we have growth? Okay, can, is there a third, third question from somebody? Um, sorry, on the left here. Uh, Olivier Marie from Maastricht University. Um, I like the point about inequality having to decrease in the UK, but um, I think the British like a certain level of inequality, and I mean the Americans like a certain level in a way, because they think it increases competition. And until people really see it as a negative externality, and I think Alan Kruger had a paper in 2002 or something called uh, externality, uh, no, uh, inequality too much of a good thing, because it's a good thing for a lot of people. So I think economists still, still need to work on making people who think inequality is relatively OK, that it's not because it's going to hurt your well-being. And in the long run, it should be really decreased for economical reasons, not for uh, socialist reasons or other things, but for people who want cost-benefit analysis. OK, I think let's um, pause there and have... Um uh, I'll respond to Marcus, actually. Uh, a brief response to, to Marcus, and of course it's a, very, it's a good question. I think it's too simplistic, though, to say it's all about fiscal consolidation. We've had, we have a hobbled banking system, which has been hit by a massive negative shock. And the I idea that that has nothing to do with the reason we've got one of the slowest recoveries, and if you read Reinhardt and Rogoff's book, the common denominator from following financial crises is that you get slow recoveries due to the, f the, the, the slow pace at which banks can restore their balance sheets and start lending under normal conditions. I, I, don't, I don't want to sit here and debate how much of it is that versus how much. I mean, clearly, there is a component that's to, to do with the fact that demand has been contracted. But to say it's all about, I, I thought that was just going too far, Marcus, to say it's all about that, because I just don't find that view credible, that it's all about it. Then the question is what you, what, you, what you do about that. But I do think there's a link to OBR. I think one of the things that OBR was meant to do originally was to have a better system of public accounting. I mean, at the heart of a lot of this is we have a totally insane way of doing public accounting between the difference between spending on something that creates a public asset and something that doesn't. And this is something that actually uh, Abak and Kotlikoff years ago uh, alerted us to. I mean, that can cut both ways. If you look in the US now, the de deficit position is far worse when you account for the liabilities implicit in mandated programs uh, for the future, which are not showing up in anything like current deficits. But they're accumulating hu huge, they're accumulating huge fiscal liabilities uh, through, through uh, Medicare and through uh, Social Security, which are not f factored in. So it cuts both ways. On both, it, ca it can mean that you exaggerate certain aspects of what a deficit is, you, you ignore others. When you look at this crazy number, which which frankly often makes very little economic sense. And I sincerely hope that when OBR gets eventually to perhaps work under more normal times, one, one, un, un, one very important agenda item here, and this is something we talk about in the report, is that we need to have a system of public accounting that allows us to invest in infrastructure in a way that doesn't count the debt that we create for that investment as somehow the same as the debt that we create if we're funding some other kind of public program. So I'm kind of half agreeing with you on, 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 on this, but I can't agree with the, the first statement that this is 100% this is to do with austerity. Uh, so I, I suppose, you know, Tim's answer illustrates the, the, the issue. <laughs> so, you know, in order to get, uh, a, you know, the, the, I think there are things we can as economists get much more consensus on than others. So I, I think the things that we focused on in this report are things where there is a, a, a broad consensus, intellectual, 
consensus amongst those of you know, look, people looking at the evidence over what needs to be done for the long run. And I think that is going to help get the kind of political consensus to get the type of things done. There's a lot less consensus over what we should do in, in the short run, both among the commissioners and also more widely amongst economists and society. So that's why I think the, the, the report the Commission focused on those things, which is easy to get agreement from that. I mean, I guess I'm more uh, sympathetic with, you know, towards your view, Mark, because I, I do think there is a, a larger component of our current problems which are due to an inappropriately fight, that tight fiscal policy. Uh, I don't think it's 100%, but I think it's, it's um, probably larger than, 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 Tim, than Tim does. Um, so, you know, I, I do think that is an important issue, but I don't think that's an issue where there's, there's huge consensus on everywhere in, among, amongst economists. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm a bit more positive about the OBR than you are. I mean, I do disagree with many of the things. I, I think they pretty underestimate the output gap. But I, I thought it was very encouraging when, uh, you know, Robert Choate... Uh, made the intervention after the Prime Minister's speech where the Prime Minister had said that there was you know, essentially you know, no evidence that fiscal consolidation had an impact on growth and uh, the, the OBR supported it. In fact, the you know, head of the OBR said that wasn't, in fact, the case and that uh, you know, the, the fiscal multipliers the OBR used did suggest there was uh, you know, a, a depressing effect on growth from, uh, from, the, from the government's uh, programme. Now, some of us would argue we think it's bigger than the OBR is saying, um, but nevertheless, that was an important, I think, part of the function of the OBR, which is to hold the government to, to account. Um, going to the other two questions, Olivia, Olivia makes the point over inequality. My, again, my, my, I think there is a lot of, you know, at the moment, you know, what, I, what happens during the run-up to the crisis is that people were prepared to be much more accepting about high levels of inequality because they viewed it as the, in some sense, maybe the price for faster growth. And what's happened since then, both in Britain and America, and in the Occupy movement, there has been a, a, a huge amount of anger about those levels of inequality, uh, which clearly, you know, think about the, the, the fact that the proportion of the top 1% has had this massive increase in the share of the pie it takes compared to other, you know, the rest of the population. People have become much more angry about that. And the anger has been very focused on things like bankers' pay and CEO pay. I think that the, the problem is kind of channeling that anger towards types of policies which actually are going to be, I think, much better at dealing with reducing uh, inequality over the long run, such as improving human capital for people at the bottom end of the distribution. So I think that it's, it's kind of using that opportunity of the outrage over what's happened to increases in inequality, and actually not just in the UK and the US, but all over, all over the, uh, the world into policies which can actually effectively tackle, tackle that. Finally, on John's, you know, John's challenge, you know, it, you know, I, it, 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 the takeover mechanism is not perfect by any means, and we know that you know, from, from the evidence of merger and acquisition is problematic. I think there is a, a positive message for some of the work which has been done looking at networks of schools and sponsored academies that they are able, some of my own work suggests this, some of the better teaching practices, the manager or practice can be extended within schools, and that's easier if they're part of the, of the same network than it is if they're kind of separate entities. It's not possible for separate entities, but it just makes it easier if you're part of the same, the same type of network. Um, but I, I don't think it's just about that. I think in, in terms of this movement towards having some greater degree of choice and competition between schools, that is actually part of the mechanism towards weakening the blocking power of union. You know, in the same way, why were the 80s reforms successful? It was a combination, I think, of greater product market competition and that helped leverage in more kind of uh, flexibility of the labor market as people realized that you know, if you were going to completely oppose uh, was changing restrictive practices, this is going to lead to your company going bankrupt. So I think those two things kind of go together. And I'd also say we do also talk about resources. So we, we propose, for example, the, uh, you know, ex ex increasing the amount of the pupil premium, that amount of money which goes to uh, lower income kids uh, more significantly, which will help bring more resources into school. But we, want to, we actually propose combining that with some of that pupil premium money being kept by the families or the kids where that money goes to. Uh, and I think the, that's important because it, you know, the evidence from the education and maintenance allowance, for example, and additional cash transfers in, in developing countries suggests that actually keeping some of the benefits 
are, the money from the, directly to the families can actually also be a way of encouraging kids to stay on at school, especially if you tie that to you know, non-absenteeism, to performance in, you know, in, 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 you know, in, in key stage uh, results as well. So we have some proposals of extra resources as well as structural reforms for uh, greater choice and accountability. Yeah, can I, I just want to quickly clarify something about the, 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 the question I posed on sort of short term versus long term. Um, I think, you know, you rightly said, John, that there's, there's lack of agreement about what should happen in terms of fiscal policy in the short run. Um, but the, the truth is that it doesn't matter. Fiscal policy is baked in. This, that first chart that I put up is going to happen. That, 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 that's, that, that's what's going to happen in the UK. So debate about what short-term fiscal policy is in terms of sort of tax and spend directly is exactly what you, you shouldn't be doing. My question was, given that we know we're not going to have a fiscal stimulus, the only person whose opinion matters is George, George Osborne. He's going to stick to that plan that I put up. Given that we know that, are there any sort of, maybe, maybe they're not your top parts of the plan, but maybe they're things that can be front-loaded. But, so, so, you see, you see the yeah. difference. But, but one, one way around, if you want to call it the fiscal straitjacket, is to recognise that infrastructure bonds can be issued, possibly if necessary, with a government guarantee, in a way that would actually be consistent, provided uh, you know, OBR play ball, which I guess would come to Marcus's point about whether they would, that, that becomes quite consistent with some expansionary. So, so the proposal on housing is to allow housing associations to borrow. Um, they claim that if you reduce, I, I used to know these numbers by heart, that if you reduce their borrowing costs by a certain number of basis points, they would, there are all sorts of investments they'd be willing to do, and you could do that with a modest government guarantee, um, which, given the way we do public accounting, makes a virtue of the rather silly way of accounting for resources, because a government guarantee wouldn't count as public debt, although it's obviously some kind of contingent liability. Um, so I think there are things we could do on the housing front that wouldn't require changing the core fiscal plans, and I think would be highly beneficial. I mean, it's worth emphasizing that the, 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 the first mandate is in terms of structurally adjusted current expenditure. And if you took that seriously, investment expenditure, which creates assets, should not be included in that. So I think that even on, I mean, there's the second mandate about reducing the, the, the degree of debts by 2015, which has been jettisoned. So I think we can all forget about you know, that one. Anyway, even if we thought that was sensible, which it clearly isn't sensible. So I think you know, Tim, Tim's point is, is exactly kind of on the money. I think even with the, um, the, the, the straight jacket the Chancellor has put himself into, I think there is plenty of opportunity for thinking about uh, investments as a way of uh, helping us out of the economic hole that we're we're currently in. I, I'm not so sure you're right, though, Richard, in saying that there is no possibility at all of deviation from those plans after 2015, well, since, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, you know, there is, there is the possibility yeah. that, that things would change. But I, I, do, I do take your, your broad point. But I, I think, it's, it's, you know, the, the recommendations we have here are actually much more about structural changes than they are about things which are going to cost huge amounts of money. I mean, that wasn't a deliberate thing, because I think, you know, we, we didn't want to close off all opportunities. But a lot of these things that we focused on are around you know, reforms to education, reforms to how we make infrastructure plans, reforms to competition and banking, you know, which you rightly emphasized. I think those are things which actually do not cost a lot of financial money. They cost political and social capital, which I think you know, we, we should spend. Okay, we probably have time for maybe two more questions. If, uh, if there's two final questions, so one, the gentleman here. Uh, Peter Dalton, um, University of Sussex and the CP. Um, if you think about our previous exercises of thinking about why our growth is poor, we would often reflect on the decline of manufacturing and uh, that it characterizes too few producers. Um, and that seems to be part of the spirit of where we are now in the, the present coalition, thinking about the public sector is too big, we have to shrink it. Um, and there's a, the notion that we're crowding out the private sector, we're crowding out competition. Um, and if you think about it, I mean, a lot of what you've said is, is directly counter to, to that, because if you're saying that, you know, we have to think quite carefully about the fiscal stimulus not being uh, there as a possibility, and we have to think quite carefully about the possibility of investment in our comparative advantage, our universities, 
uh, our infrastructure and so on. That's immediately counter to the idea that seems to be prevalent and have so much currency at the moment that we have to shrink the public sector and have to, because it crowds out the private sector. And it, it seems that that debate that we've had previously when we talked about growth and the heart of Britain's problem uh, hasn't been revisited in this particular re-examination of growth. I wonder if you had a, a, a view about that. I mean, maybe it's just an irrelevance to say we have too few producers, manufacturing is declining. But in some sense, a heart back to that debate when we previously talked about why uh, growth in Britain is so poor. I'm thinking back to Bacon and Altis and all those things back in the 70s. It seems to me that that's part, of, part and parcel of the debate we should still be having now in terms of where that investment is coming from and how it should be targeted. And the crucial question, you know, how is it going to be funded? I know you've, you've partly answered that in some of your responses, but I think that's the heart of the question, really. Okay, final question. Uh, Thomas Mikulski from HEC Paris. Uh, well, I'm uh, European, so I, would, I was particularly struck that in what you presented, there's no international aspect. It's like a closed economy. Does it matter? Doesn't it? it does the euro uh, matter? Uh, does the UK's position in the EU matter? The Doha round? Can you make uh, any comments? Maybe it's unimportant. Okay, so we have a... Uh, five minutes left. I, I just wanted to add one small thing which is following on from what Richard said, which is, you know, if you think back to the Spence, what was that thing called? The, it was called the Growth Commission, wasn't it? You know, Spence and others. Maybe just to push you a little bit, maybe in a minute, to say, what do you do next, if anything? Uh, you've had this commission, um, but it, again, going back to Richard, it's, how does that move into policy? You've given some examples, but Perhaps to push you that push you on that a little bit because it's not so clear in the case of the Spence Commission what what actually changes the result. <laughs> okay, uh, very, so, so very quickly um, on Peter's Peter's question. Um, I mean, we had a very big debate actually on, on exactly this kind of issue. Of, I guess it's broadly rebalancing, but specifically on is the size of the state the problem? And there's a big debate going on. One one view is that. Yeah, it is the state has got too big, basically, it's spending got too big, and it, there's a structural need to shrink the state. But I think the view of the Commission, as we expressed in the report, was that it's not, that the, the, the actual size of the state per se is not the issue. You can have very successful economies with relatively large states, high tax, and more spending, and successful economies at the other end of the spectrum, in Nordic countries versus America. For example, you look at the evidence. There's no, there's no, although many, some people like John Moulton were arguing for this, when we looked at the evidence, that wasn't the case in our view. It's actually not about the, I mean, yeah, if you, obviously if you, if you get to, you know, Soviet Union levels, it's a problem, but then if you get to other levels of failed states, the problem in the other direction. The levels between that we see in typically in OECD countries is not how much money you get, it's how you get that money, the, the structure of the tax system, the benefits system, as, as, uh, as the Merlis have said, and you know, how the state uses that. So the, the proposals we make are really about how um, the state could work better in terms of the services and the investments it makes. So that really are our kind of conclusion in the report. In terms of the questions of the, the international dimension, we, we do have, you know, we had a very international set of commissioners. Uh, we do talk about this. Um, I suppose the, you know, the, I guess it, the way I think about industrial policy, the way we describe this in the report, is that a modern industrial strategy looks at the, the position of the UK in the world and then tries to think about two things. One, you know, where is our latent comparative advantage relative to other countries? And secondly, where are the areas of global growth? And once you've kind of seen those, you kind of, with laser-like effort, put your effort on removing barriers to those, those sectors and those firms to grow. So, for example, universities would be a classic example of that. You know, what, one thing you don't want to do is start slapping down loads of heavy visa restrictions on restricting the ability to recruit good students and good faculty from all over the world would be one obvious example of uh, anti-industrial policy, which we're currently pursuing. Uh, another, uh, and, you know, another thing would be on you know, planning restrictions outside Oxford and Cambridge to allow clusters of um, software firms to grow. One of the hardest things it is to actually to get planning commission to build buildings to house um, laboratories and, uh, 
and places for, for software. So you know, that's, that's the kind of modern industrial policy, which is very much thinking about printing place in, 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 in the world, I think. And, you know, I guess I don't have any brilliant insights onto Robin's, uh, Robin's challenge. I mean, Tim might want to take that up. I mean, I, I do, I, you know, we have, we have a, you know, a plan, I guess, a follow-up plan, which involves, um, in, you know, talking to lots of people within the government on the nuts and bolts of how we would implement this through the Department of Business, Department of Education, other departments. And, you know, we're, you know we have various groups of members of the commissioners like um, Rachel Lomax is in the armament, armament Commission, trying to do this. Now, will that be successful? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> and e even ex post, with all our great evaluation, I think we still probably won't know. But I suppose it's, uh, it's like, you know, what did Antonio Gramsci say? It's kind of, you know, pessimism of the intellect, but optimism of the will. So I hope, that <laughs> I hope, I hope that's how we make it happen. So just, just one or two brief cards. I, we So on the international position, um, we certainly, as a sort of subtext, even if I think we may even say this at various points, we, our assumption is that the UK continues to be a member of the European Union and we don't create too much uncertainty about that uh, and that therefore we benefit from the many uh, changes that have occurred in the European Union developing an open market. I mean, I personally would be in favor of liberalizing competition in services across Europe and other, other things. Um, so we, you know, we're fully behind, implicitly, um, playing a major role in both in Europe and uh, supporting further attempts to open up and to maintain openness to trade globally. I think that one, one issue that slightly joins the, the, two, the two points that made, though, the one area of disappointment for the UK, arguably, uh, has been with a, a significant decline in our exchange rate um, and a, a weakness in our, uh, in our export sector. Uh, and export sectors, and equally, the, our performance in, uh, in exporting to some of the faster growing economies in the world. Um, now, I don't think that's a matter of government policy to say, you know, if you want to export more to Brazil or China, this is how you do it. But I do think there's a kind of uh, set of issues there. But we think we're more in favor of sort of what you call a horizontal, what we call a horizontal approach, the kind of getting the basics right as a basis for uh, promoting, uh, promoting those sectors that will be strong and competitive in a, in a global world. And finally, on the, on the what next, I think it's, it is important uh, sort of in a, in a bigger picture sense for, for economists to remain engaged in debates about the long term. And, you know, we don't, we, one advantage, so, you know, I think John mentioned, there have been lots of reports on growth. Um, they're to a penny at some level. Um, but one of the advantages of having it in, in, in an academic institution is we're here for the long haul. Um, you know, we, we are, as a group of, uh, of, of uh, analysts, uh, are going to be around, hopefully, making these points consistently beyond the, 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 the date that the report has uh, is, is perhaps um, been potentially neglected. I mean, it is important that we, as academics, take advantage of the fact that we are long-term players in these debates, and uh, we, keep on the, we keep up the pressure uh, that, that way. Because many of the government reports, some of which have been extremely good, like the Eddington Review on Transport, is actually a very, very good document. You know, the day that uh, review was completed, the team is disbanded, and then the report just gathers dust, or whatever the internet equivalent of gathering <laughs> dust is. We need a new metaphor. Exactly, we need a metaphor for that. Um, but I think it, it is important that as a kind of, uh, as a collective, that you know, we recognize that we need to con consistently make a contribution. So we're not going away. We will do a six month review, we'll do a one year review, I'm sure. We will, we will try to continue to contribute to this debate. Okay, I'm gonna give da uh, David the last word. Yeah, my, my ears pricked up when you mentioned too few producers, because we, uh, the Sunday Times carried that, of course, uh, the Bacon and Eltis articles in the, in the 70s. Uh, I just wanted to say, I think the context is completely different now. I don't, I don't think it's anything to do with fears of crowding out or anything like that. I, I, and I know some people, uh, including I think Paul Krugman, believe what is happening is ideological. I, I just don't think that's the case. I mean, if you think of the Conservative Party before the election and before the crisis, they were talking about sharing the proceeds of economic growth between lower taxes and higher public spending, not taking office and cutting public spending. It's financially driven. It's, it's trying to adjust the size of the public sector to the plausible size of the tax base in, in future years. I, I, I think that's what's happening. Nothing to do with crowding out. I don't think it's ideological either. 
Okay, so just to thank John, Tim, and also uh, Richard and David for coming in at short notice. So can we, uh, everybody, and, and obviously thank you for all coming. And so let's uh, just join to say thank you to the panel for an excellent session. Thank you.